All right, welcome back to a bonus episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, let me tell you what we're doing right now. We're getting ready to uh, release some of the archive that we found from when we were the sci-fi shenanigans. Uh, we're going to get those up there for for the posts that were brought down we thought you might enjoy them um and so without further ado let us uh let's roll that beautiful oh wait they're gonna sue me play it hey all you crazy sci-fi fans time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the sci-fi shenanigans podcast just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions a place where the sky's the limit, space is a place, and nerds run the world. And without further ado. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Today, we're doing things a little bit different. We have not two, but three of our uh, new co-hosts available, and then two guests. So it's going to be the wild, Yay. wild west up in here, and uh, <laughs> we apologize for nothing. So our special guest today to talk about the Black Tide Rising universe is John Ringo. Uh, John Ringo is a professional author of, well, he used to say science fiction, then came There Will Be Dragons, which is sci-fi with a distinct fantasy twist. Then came Ghost, which I'm told is Fifty Shades of Guns. Uh, Then came Princess of Wands, a Christian soccer mom battling demons through the power of God. Who knows what's next? Children's book. He's actually got one mapped out. There's a girl who's raised by dolphins. You think he's joking, don't you? (laughs) <laughs> okay that's my best uh, uh scary voice uh you know dad jokes what kind of scary no uh, maybe once upon a time i like to tell myself i was scary um <laughs> all right and then we have his co-host mike massa mike has lived an adventurous life including stints as a navy seal officer an investment banker an entrepreneur and u- university researcher in addition to the usual military deployments he has lived outside the u.s for several years as a civilian <laughs> mostly in South America and Europe. Uh, newly published, Mike is married and enjoys the challenges of three sons in a growing cohort, I like that word, by the way, of grandsons, all of whom check daily to see if today is the day they can pull down the old lion. So have they succeeded yet? <laughs> uh, the closest they came to it was my number two son, who dove off uh, the platform or the landing of the stairs about eight feet off the ground, and Powell drove me into the ground and cracked my head against the cement. Wow. Hey, he- That's the closest that we've come to uh, pulling the lion down. And mom picked him up and they both got in the car and left because as soon as I got up, I was going to kick his little ass. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Dominic can totally – Dominic can take you, man. Uh, At this point, Dominic can take you. This this was when he was uh, sixth or seventh grade, BS. To be fair – That's when he was in seventh grade. You should see him now. The guy is a freaking moose. Yeah, he's about 6'1", 210, ain't none of it fat. But at the time, I had been encouraging all the boys – Hey, if you want to take me out, do your best. Just make sure it goes both ways. So I brought it on myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like you need the uh, crocodile hunter guy out there narrating your family reunions. <laughs> <Blimey>. Danger, <laughs> danger, danger. All right. Dominic stalks the old lion. <laughs> so, the next part of the introduction, dear listener, is how we first met them. So I actually first met Mike uh, Massa at RavenCon 2016, and he was on a panel about writing believable military units. Uh, he was a pretty friendly guy. Didn't look uh, at me funny for constantly moving so people weren't behind me. Um, that's when I was, uh, just starting to work the therapy people. I was crazier then. Uh, and Ringo, who hasn't heard of this dude? Uh, so when Siska asked if we wanted them on the show, we said yes. Uh, and they were scheduled <laughs> seriously within three days. Uh, normally we book two months ahead, but you know, we've been the rules for this one. Uh, I'm always interested in meeting other veterans who've traded their guns for metaphorical pin or well, I messed that up. Uh, and I know Chris isn't going to cut this out in post, so I'm just going to nope. read that again. So I'm always interested in meeting other veterans who've traded their guns for pens. Uh, and uh, we'll move on. And um, save me from myself. So, Chris, how did you first hear of or find these two? Well, I just stepped out of my underground bunker and took off my tinfoil hat yesterday. So uh, I'm meeting them for the first time today. Hey, guys. I, I work in that bunker. That's where I work. <laughs> Oh, you're that bunker, guy. Right? I am in a bunker right now, which is why I get the echoes. Okay? This is my freaking bunker, man. It's, it's legit. <laughs> it's, a, it's an underground cinder block room. Legit. Like, 
Awesome. So gray jealous. walls, pink, all painted gray. It looks like a South American prison cell. Dude, I'm so uh, jealous I right know. now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that one time you were on vacation. Oh, that's right. Uh, non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what, what about this you? is answer. What about you, Seska? How did you well, first meet these two crazy cats? Um, I actually, the first time I – my mom, when I was shipping off to basic training, thrust a John Ringo book at me and said, here, read it before the drill sergeants take it. But then they'll at least have some good reading. Um, that was my mother for you. And then um, I met John at a Dragon Con, I think, for the first time. But it turns out we had a lot of mutual friends. So we've and we go we both go to Liberty Con. And um, so that's where we really started to meet and hang out um, with Mike. Uh, the first time I probably talked to him was after a panel where he uh, he had gotten his first contract, actually, for one of the books in the Black Tide Rising series. And in the middle of a panel, and he starts reading it, and then he signs it with a big flourish, and he presented it to Tony Weisskopf like a man does when he's proposing to a woman. And it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> should- and... Um, Hmm? I, I said I should have checked that contract more closely. The bit about the uh, the clause about the firstborn male son and being delivered to the company was a complete surprise. <laughs> <laughs> You'll so, miss that boy. Yeah, somebody has to carry the books around, right? But uh, no, so and then we all became friends. I think really through Liberty Con and mutual friends too. And Dragon, all right. Yes, lots of Dragon time. Lots of Dragon time. All right. Okay, so the first question, and I have my mouse over the kick buttons, the religion (laughs) question, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? John, do you want to go first? No, you go first. So obviously Firefly, (laughs) obviously Firefly, but if I couldn't pick Firefly and death was not an option, I would say the Star Trek universe, but Deep Space Nine seasons three through seven only. Yes! Wow, okay, very specific. Yes. I know my so track. This, does this mean you're also a uh, Babylon uh, Five fan? Um, I, there are there are elements of Babylon Five that I really enjoy. Uh, I actually, yeah, yeah, two two through four, uh, especially season three and four, of Babylon Five, yeah. are quite good. That that's how uh, you know they're nerds. In my case, though, but in my case, though, Expanse. Okay. If you haven't. Seen you're wrong, okay. you should beat your face, man. Just get down and do Just the beat your face, push. drive it. <laughs> oh, I, I can't use the F word, can I? You can say whatever you want. Just beat your face. If you have not seen Expanse, beat your face, man. <laughs> Expanse, is, Expanse is really incredible science fiction. I mean, the, the science in Expanse. Okay, there are places where it's kind of like, you know, they, they get it wrong. But the stuff that they get wrong leaps out at you because so much of it is so accurate. It's a, it's unreal. yeah. It is it is by far the least wrong science fiction spaceship show I've ever seen. And they and they obviously had really good advisors and took those advisors' comments into heart. And there's there's one scene. There's just this one short moment in like the first episode that that people scream about because it looks like a guy opens up his faceplate when he's in vacuum. And like takes a breath, but it's this guy has been in space so much that he doesn't care. He's got something that's dangling in front of his eye, so he just opens up his he just opens up his suit and pulls this thing out away from his eye, and then lets out a breath and closes his suit. And you can do that. I mean, it's very very accurate. It's that accurate. It's it's science that's so good that people that think they understand the science complain about it. Because they don't actually understand the science. I think Jr. should try that trick first. Well, when we get the wormholes active, I'm shoving you through first. So I guess it's only <laughs> fair. Oh, man. It, 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 well, one of the problems is finding another planet that's actually truly habitable. Uh, one of the things that I do not like about Expanse is the whole thing about everybody in Mars is on do- in domes. You can't use domes in Mars. You're going to die from the freaking radiation. Mm. Yeah. Um, There's anyway. caves there that, that that you can go, but you know. Anyway, we're moving on because we want to talk about you guys, not the expanse. Right. Okay, yeah. Mike. What do you love about science fiction as a genre? It's there's no limit, and, and you can exp- I mean, It's such a trite answer, but it, I'm sure it's one you hear quite often. Uh, the only limits are those you impose upon your own imagination, and it's a vehicle for discussing almost anything. Um, 
the the science fiction aspect is a, just another way to to place your characters into really spectacular and interesting uh, or tragic circumstances and explore them. I'm I'm a tremendous fan of either in uh, character driven fiction. So you can get all your science details right or true to canon if your characters are not on. It's not going to work. Got okay. it. What about you, John? Um, everything that Mike just said, uh, totally on point. Um, all science fiction is really about telling some other story just set in a science fiction environment. It can be a war story. It can be a love story. It can be a, uh, it can be a techno thriller. It can be a detective novel. You're just putting it into a, into a more advanced technological environment. Um, but what I really like about it is the hope. Um, I do not like dystopian science fiction. Um, because technology has improved a lot of human beings tremendously. Everybody, you know, everybody complains about the modern world. Everything's so screwed up and everything's wrong and oh, the pollution and oh, the plastic, and, oh, this, and, oh, God, plastic straws are going to destroy the world. <laughs> um, but technology has just improved our lives to such a, a degree that people who don't understand history don't understand how much better it is now. So for me, the advance of time and the advance of technology is only going to make things in in certain ways better. Humans are always going to be stupid, <laughs> okay? We're always going to be dumb. We're always going to be killing each other. We're always going to be coming up with stupid stuff. Uh, but the stupidity would be more interesting oh, in space. Yeah. We're on a different planet. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah where the stakes are higher. <laughs> <laughs> where the stakes are higher. So uh, that's what it is for me. It's really about that, the hope of the future. Um, none of my stuff is truly dystopian. And that's why you need to make... No, you are Lord of the Apocalypse, though. Like, all your books spoke it. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I've wiped out the human race so many times at this point. <laughs> we should all be dead. Um, <laughs> I have. I mean, I've, I've knocked... I mean, in, in this series, I knocked the human race down to 1% of the population. <laughs> um I, and I wiped them out in the Pleistocene universe. I killed a whole bunch of them and other stuff. Uh, oh, there will be dragons. Yeah, I killed most of them there too. Um, you know, so I, I wiped out the human race over and over again because people are stupid. Right? So J.K. Rowling, uh, on the anniversary of her last book, it sends out the apology for the various characters she killed. So I guess for you, it wouldn't be character, but continent you'd have to start apologizing for. So today I'm going to uh, I'm going to apologize for Europe. I. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to apologize for what I did to Europe in the post lean universe. Sorry about having you all eaten by carnivorous aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Africa, not apologizing for Africa. Um. <laughs> all right, it's you, Tasco. Okay, so um, this is an interesting question because I don't think we've ever talked about it. How do you, how does your love of science fiction genre transition into your writing in the novels? But you skipped you, a question. No, no. Yeah, it? you're supposed to ask him about Oops. his first memory. See, we're professionals, people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question number eight. Oh, yeah, eight. eight comes before nine. I have two science degrees, can you tell? Yeah. What's your fa- <laughs> What's your it's first memory of watching, reading, or playing games in the science fiction genre? Uh, for me, it was uh, buying the Monster Manual brand new off the shelf in the late 70s uh, and playing D&D with my friends. That was the first time I... I thought it was fourth grade, fifth grade, and uh, escaping into a world oblivious to everything else for hours. And then uh, except yeah. for pause when you're ravenously hungry and you go to your friend's uh, mom's uh, refrigerator and you empty it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard to imagine that the world before Rip It. So what what did uh, young Mike Massa drink? Was it was it? Well, back then we had this uh, always the choices weren't quite as many. And it's uh, the best drink is whatever they had chilling in their refrigerator. Um, but typically uh, favorites back then, there was this drink called Fanta. And my best friend's mom loved lime Fanta. So I drank a lot of it because <laughs> <laughs> it was free wow. and it was cold. <laughs> Spoken like a true soldier. Yep. All right. And you, John? John. Oh, um, uh, I, I misread the question. Um, my first memory of science fiction is not actually science fiction. It's science fact. 
Um, my first memory of science fiction was when my brother took me, uh, uh, Walter Cronkite was crying on TV and I couldn't understand why. And my older brother took me by the hand and he took me out on the balcony of our apartment and he pointed up at this gibbous moon in the sky and he said, John, there's a man standing up there. And I didn't really get it. Wow. But my whole family has always been into science and science fiction. And the first science fiction book I ever read was uh, Doc Smith's Gray Lensman. Oh, yeah. Uh, about nine years old. And I was living in, a, in Tehran at the time. My dad worked in Abadan. And he spent three weeks in Abadan, and then he'd fly back for a week in Tehran. And when he flew back to Abadan, he left Gray Lensman behind, and I was out of books. So I picked it up, and I've been hooked ever since. All right, let me scroll back up. So that's the, the danger of taking the show notes is you got to scroll up and down the document. So how did your love of science fiction translate into you writing novels in it? Uh, again, I, my, my name is first, so I guess I'll go first. But uh, that's a, a super complex answer, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. But in, in short, you go from, in, the, in my case, from utterly loving what you're reading, what you're consuming as far as science fiction to saying, man, I had this great idea, but boy, that's you know, the notion of, of launching a world or writing in someone else's world is really daunting, to um, daring to reach out to one or more authors to say, look, I really appreciate the you work that you did, really enjoyed your story, uh, and which is the, you know, how I met John. I, um, I uh, sent him a note from uh, where I was working in San Diego. I think I was just getting off active duty at the time. And uh, over the years, I we, became- We met in Mysterious Galaxy. That's right. We Curious Galaxy, yeah. And uh, uh, ended up uh, being one of John's many, many uh, sort of uh, consultants when he had a technical question related to a specialty where you might know something. Uh, and finally, um, being asked if I wanted to submit a story. And that was that's how I transitioned from loving it to knowing some of the authors to contributing in a minor way uh, to being asked if I want to contribute in a more meaningful way. Okay. And what about you, John? Um, I was, uh, my mother, my late mother said that she always knew that I was going to be an author. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, cause I was a kid who never turned in his assignments. Um, but, uh, I was pulling a gig as an overpaid security guard and it was out of town. It was 12 on 12 off sitting in an office, eh, much like this concrete bunker. And, uh, I would read books like 12 hours at a time. And I just had gotten read so many of them that uh, I had to sort of regurgitate the ideas back out. Um, and that's actually what started me writing. I started writing longhand on yellow pads, just sitting in this office. And uh, my first novel will never see the light of day because it was utterly God awful. <laughs> a couple of people have seen it and they're like, Oh my God, that's utterly God awful. Um, <laughs> and uh, I finished writing that thing, which was like 50,000 words of just dreck. Um, and I went, well, this is dreck. Having reread it, this is dreck. So I started another one and that became a Him Before Battle, which was my first published novel. Um, so that was, that was my introduction. To I think that's actually, that's okay. actually the book my mom handed me when I was leaving to go to MEPS to ship to basic. So. Yeah, either that or Starship Troopers. Is, I I had a I had that crusty first sergeant when I was in. Um, he was five tour Vietnam Ranger, um, and basically he was just he just hung out waiting for a war because he really loved war. Um, he was totally disappointed by Grenada, man. I mean, he was totally disappointed. <laughs> but uh, so. Uh, at one point I'm out in the field and I was a driver and I worked with the first sergeant and I'm reading a book and he's like, Ringo, you're reading now. Uh, and I look at it, I go, um, it's, uh, it's a book called, uh, Starship Troopers. It's about space airborne first sergeant. And he goes, that's that one by Haney Lane. <laughs> I go, yes, first sergeant. I didn't correct him on the name. Right. <laughs> I, I, sergeant, he said, well, that's okay. That ought to be issued in basic training. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> it turns out that he'd read like 6,000 books. Wow. Um, he was an avid reader. He had his master's in international studies. Um, and you wouldn't know it from knowing Top Angelique yet. But, yeah, he was an incredibly brilliant guy. Anyway. All right. All right, so transitioning away from the writing side, let's talk about things from a fan angle. What's the weirdest or funniest story about an interaction with a fan that you've had since you started writing? We'll start with John. <laughs> um, <laughs> must be a good uh, one. So I'm at, uh, uh, this is a long one, you might have to cut it. I'm at a uh, uh, science fiction convention, I won't say where, and uh, this gentleman comes up to me, uh, accompanied by a lady and he's I've seen him walking around uh, he, he's doing the Tim Conway old man walk he's this older guy and he's, he's just kind of doing the Tim Conway thing right and he comes up to me and he, he takes my hand very gently and he very gently shakes it and he says Mr. Ringo you have a fine hand for writing the warrior now I've had a lot of compliments about my writing but that was very very beautifully phrased um, so later on in the evening, I'm sitting around with some people and I'm holding court and we're telling war stories. I'm telling some of my minor dumbass war stories and talking about this and that. And this guy is sitting there very, very quietly, not saying anything. At a certain point, the lady with him passes a note to my wife. And, um, this was 2005 and this guy had been a tunnel rat in Vietnam uh, he was a founding member of Delta Force. He had transitioned up to Sergeant Major, then was made direct mission to, to First Lieutenant. He was now a full bird colonel, active duty. And this was 2005, and he'd been in Vietnam. Um, he had four silver stars, two distinguished service crosses, one still under consideration for upgrade to Medal of Honor when the operation was declassified. Wow. And and uh, uh, he was the commander of the rescue mission in Mogadishu at Black Hawk Down. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I'm sitting here and this guy is listening to my war stories. You know, I said, you know, he's probably got better stories than I do, but they're probably all classified. He just kind of nods. <laughs> all right. That's, a, that's an interesting story. Uh, thank you for sharing anyway. it. And, um, so this is the part of the interview where I list out the various series that uh, in books that the they have written. So with Mike Maza, we have The Valley of Shadows, Black Tide Rising Book 6 with John Ringo, Voices of the Fall, Black Tide Rising Book 7 with John Ringo, and River of Night, a Black Tide Rising novel with John Ringo. We have Forged in Blood, a Freehold University anthology, Freehold Resistance anthology, Terra Nova, The War of Liberation anthology. Black Tide Rising, Black Tide Rising Anthologies Volume 1, Stellaris, People of the Stars Anthology, Lost Signals of the Terran Republic Anthology, and the Noir Fatale Anthology. Uh, and then with John Ringo, this is where I list. Oh, you know what? I'm not listing his books. Who am I kidding? Everyone knows who he is. He's uh, probably written yeah. more books than some that, libraries that have in take. them. Uh, he's a very prolific <laughs> author. Yep. So if you want to know about everything he's written, I'm sure there's a wiki page out there somewhere, and I will look for it and put it in the show notes. And then all of his social media will be in the show notes. So you can stalk him as you do. And uh, the, uh, next the only thing I'd like to say about that is uh, – if you're looking for an intro, as Seska man mentioned, just start with him before battle. Um, okay. Or the Black Tide books. The first book of those is Under a Graveyard Sky. And uh, Under a Graveyard Sky is a fast, you know, for zombie apocalypse, it's a fun read is the best way to phrase it. Anyway. It's the only zombie stuff I read. Yeah. All right. And I will throw all that in his personal show notes. And uh, the next one is your question, Seska. So now we're going to focus on the Black Tide Rising books and how did you guys come up with the idea or premise for the series um, and what sparked the in information, uh, the, what sparked it? And it's kind of odd asking that because I actually know the answer for for the initial yeah. story um, arc, but not for Mike's portion of the story arc. Well, let me, let me go ahead and start on that one. Um, I hate zombie stories. Uh, <laughs> I really do. Um, just, ignore his, 
the, the premise of every zombie movie is a bunch of losers somehow temporarily survive the zombie apocalypse and they stumble their way to the victory through utter incompetence. I'm pretty sure that somewhere in the Walking Dead universe, there's a group centered around somebody like our mutual friend Jack Clemens, riding out the apocalypse in style and comfort. They're zombies for fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody in this group in a zombie apocalypse is going to do nothing that the people in the movies do. Nothing. Okay. We are all smarter than that. We all have too much background to make those stupid, dumb mistakes. Um, I know a lot of competent people. Uh, Mike Massa is a clear example. In the apocalypse, the competent people are going to end, tend to survive more than the incompetent. In fact, if co- incompetent people survive, it will probably be due to competent people keeping them alive. Eventually, I got so fed up, I decided to write The Competent People's Guide to a Zombie Apocalypse. That was under a graveyard sky. Um, you know, uh, there were, in some of the questions in this, it was very clear that uh, uh, JR has not read any of these books. Uh, you're wrong, beat your face. <laughs> I made a career of hearing that. Um, <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, these are the smart people's zombie books, you know, uh, and, and it's most of the most zombie stuff is about me. And I wasn't going to write misery. Porn. I wasn't going to write uh, losers who are just, you know, this is their last day. The two main characters who sort of took over the original books were Faith and Sophia. Yes! Sophia, of course. They're was, amazing. But the character that was on every single page is Hope. These books aren't about misery porn. They're about competent people gathering others together in a community to save as many as possible and keep the flame of civilization burning. They're about riding the day every day into sunset, finding the way back home. That's my okay. answer. Wow. Okay. Um, so now that we know where the, where the serious idea came from, where did the idea for the novels that were co-written come from? Do uh, you just want to pick one? Uh, Mike? Sure. Uh, so the first co-written novel in the Under a Graveyard Sky universe, the Black Tide Rising universe, was The Valley of Shadow. And um, it came about because I did uh, did a short story um, in the first anthology called Black Tide Rising. And the notion is that uh, competent people are going to make their very best effort to survive. And the way this disease was designed, and it was designed in, in, in consultation with a couple of scientists, one noted neuroscientist, and we can discuss the, you know, what is the nature of this, this plague in a different question. But the net net is that it doesn't happen all in a split second. Civilization is built over thousands of years. It's not going to fall in an hour. And so the first half um, of actually, yeah, the first half of John's first novel in her graveyard sky traces the fall and it references the interaction between this group of survivors and their family some of which stays ashore. One notable character belongs to a large uh, international investment bank. And banks, other than being somehow vaguely responsible for the 2007-2008 financial crisis, are are big organizations that are not well understood by the average Joe Blow organization uh, or or Joe Blow citizen. Joe Sixpack has no idea uh, how a bank works and why that matters to them, apart from the fact that I go to the ATM and money comes out and my life goes forward. In, right. in fact, but, if, but if how banks, exactly does that work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the purposes of the story, if the banks can't function, then basic things like getting gasoline at your corner gasoline store, paying for the trucks that bring the food to the grocery stores, um, keeping your essential services, emergency services running, keeping the uh, communications networks functioning. All that goes away and it goes away pretty rapidly. So the core concept was if you don't have amongst other critical parts of infrastructure like energy and logistics, if you you can't run those, if you don't have a functioning economy, the banks are critical to a functioning economy, love them or hate them, you got to have them. So what if one of these key critical characters was actually inside a bank watching the crisis unfold? And it turns out, uh, little known fact, there is a significant cadre of former special operations um, personnel who work in the investment banking world. Because frankly, there's a lot of money there. I was one of them for for several years. And um, among the responsibilities, in addition to running uh, running the books and running deals and 
uh, being traders, they're also involved in the risk and resiliency or the security functions of the bank writ larger. And that was my role. And so I was I was able to serve first as a consultant for John and then later uh, suggest this as an angle, um, watching this apocalypse begin to unfold and then potentially reverse with enough smart people trying hard enough, I'll pull them together. Yeah, I love this book. I think Valley wow. of Shadows makes a good second entry point if somebody doesn't want to go back and read the first four that John wrote, that this is a, or five, this is a great way to dive into the universe because you do do a lot of the layout. Well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Valley of Shadows starts about a day before Under a Graveyard Sky starts because the, the very first, I'll give away the very first line in the very first book that John pens, which is the, the key character gets an apocalypse code from his contact in a banking and intelligence group. And the key, the, the central character in the novel that we co-wrote is that person who launches that apocalypse code saying, no shit, get out of town. <laughs> okay, so to, to make this a little easier, because Mike just gave a very, very complex, fascinating answer. <laughs> <laughs> when I came up with the idea for the books, I, of course, need characters. So one of the characters that I grabbed was my friend Mike Massa, who was a former guy in a bank in New York um, who did security stuff. So I I just basically stole Massa as a character. Hmm, and nice. And other than that, well, I've I've stolen Massa as a character uh, two or three times. <laughs> yeah. He he rips off all parts of my soul and then sells them for money. It's that's the nature of our Is friendship. That's what you got into writing. I do. You finally I, dropped I, it off your own soul. I really do. <laughs> um, I've also I've also killed him once. Um, uh, but I, I I needed a character in New York for or plot reasons. So I just used Mike and that ended up expanding quite a bit. And so in graveyard sky, the whole first half takes place in New York city. And it is this family of four who, uh, Tom Smith is the guy who is in the, in the bank. And Steve Smith is his brother who is a, is a teacher who has this family. And it's mostly about the family. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, so what happened with Valley of Shadows is that uh, I uh, we did an anthology and because I wanted to explore some of the stuff in New York in more detail, I asked Mike to write it, to, to write a short story in the anthology. And to be honest, what I was expecting was that I would get this kind of very, very rough story. And I would probably have to fix it a lot and, and sort of rewrite it in the background without my name being attached to it. What I got instead was something that should have gotten a Hugo Award. Wow. Um, it, 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 it needed a couple of commas moved around. Uh, other than that, it was just this fantastic story. It's called The Battle of the Birds. Um, and so uh, after that, I said, hey, would you like to write the Tom Smith story? Uh, what happened to Tom Smith in those, in those books? And so uh, Valley of Shadows, the first book uh, in, of the co-authored books, is essentially the first half of Graveyard Sky expanded, but from the point of view of Tom Smith. And it's fascinating. It's about all of the skullduggery that, that's occurring as everybody's trying to hold on to civilization. And at the same time, everybody's got their eye on my fall, so how do I survive and how do I gain power from that? Um, and uh, anyway, that that's that's the complete answer to the story. Okay, well, question. before we move on, this is the part where we shamelessly shill for the man, and we pause for a commercial interlude. When it comes to exploration, Yajane doesn't know when to quit. She joins an Imperial Relief Fleet in an attempt to track down a friend turned enemy while vast storms blast humanity's frontier. Yajane will need to brave rebels, aliens, and the machinations of the Empire's agents to survive. How can she, when she doesn't know what she'll do, when she finally tracks down her prey? Stormfleet, The Pillar Universe, Book 1, is a space opera adventure by Tim Niederreiter. No planets, no stars, no problem. Find it now on Amazon.com. All right, welcome back. Thank you for sticking with us through that commercial, and we are back. That was that was like three one thousand. 
<laughs> I don't does the math. I was infantry for a reason. Was, hey, you said you said wait five, not three. Okay, <laughs> we've got to get our timing down here. All right. Synchronize <laughs> watches and go. All right. So this is where you make fun of the grunt again. I see how it is. All right. So welcome back. As I think you can, it's sibling love. He one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one. I see the light. Hey, the shoot hasn't opened yet. Am I supposed to do something? <laughs> Airborne. All right. So as you can see, we've got John Ringo and Mike Massa still with us. And the next question is yours, Seska. Save me, please. <laughs> oh, but it's so much fun watching you struggle. Um, I mean, uh, so what? I mean, what research did you actually end up doing for all of this? Uh, and uh, can you talk about? the nature of the disease. Cause JR wrote a question about the undead, but we, but I, I've read this entire series. So I know there's no undead. In fact, I even told him that. Yeah. They're not zombies. They're infected. Okay. But, Dan. but sometimes you ask questions, you know, the answer to, because the audience might not know that. Oh, good oh. point. I Zing. remember I'm still right. a rookie. Okay. So, so we're going back to 19. Uh, we're, we're at uh, 17 now because he skipped 16. Or 20. <laughs> Oh, okay. yeah, our, our, all our numbers are different. Oh, that's good. It's a regular Laurel and Moving on, I have to ask, why zombies? What is it about the undead that appeals to you? John Ringo, not undead, 28 days bio-zombies. So technically, not zombies, a running, which which is a running gag in the series because char- there's always the pedantic character that's like, they're not zombies, they're infected. And somebody else is always like, pedant. Um <laughs> In all of these stories, zombies are just a background. Uh, You can talk about 28 Days. You can talk about uh, Walking Dead. You can talk about Night of the Living Dead, the the various Romero ones. Um, But even the movies, uh, zombies are simply the overall issue. It's a situation where a small group has to work together to survive. Um, and, And what is important about that, why that is popular I could talk about all day long, but you see it in castaway movies uh, and and stuff like that. Robinson Crusoe, Swiss Family Robinson, Lost in Space. The zombies simply set up a situation where people have to, instead of being part of this massive civilization that we're in, people have to come back to a small, complex, either messed up or not so messed up community and survive. Um, That's the nature of all post-apocalyptic stories. Um, so it's, it's not really about the, the walking dead or the zombies. It's never about the zombies. It's about the people. That's my answer. And I'm sticking to it. Well, do you <laughs> want to talk about the CDC story? You could have set it up um, just so you it sounded a little better. Jeez. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, what, what reason? okay. So when, when I came, when I decided to do this story instead of a Carrington event story, which is what I was originally going to do, um, uh, do you know what the Carrington event is? Nope. Uh, okay, for the for the listeners, the Carrington event was something that happened in 1856, back before we had electronics technology. Um, it's a super massive coronal mass ejection um, that oh, hits yeah. the magnetic field at a specific angle. And it basically breaks the magnetic field. And what happens with that is it destroys everything electrical. Um, You can argue about whether it would have the same effect as an EMP and destroy electronics or not. It's it's one of those things that nobody knows until it happens. If it happens, we are so screwed and blue blue and tattooed. Um, I ideated that story over and over again. It was so grim, I just decided not to do it. So I switched over to biological zombies. Um... With the bio zombies, uh, I wanted to have a biology that actually made sense. So I worked with a friend who I'll, I'll call Dr. Ted Roberts, um, speaker to lab rats, and came up with a somebody opening and closing a file drawer in the background. <laughs> um, Nothing here. <laughs> uh, so I, I came up with an idea that, that seemed to make sense on something that would actually effectively spread and, and would work. Um, the CDC story, though, is after the first books came out. 
And a friend of mine who uh, has friends at the CDC was talking to the assistant director at the CDC. And somehow the subject of my books came up. And CDC and U.S. AMRID had both decided that they didn't like my books. And the reason they didn't like my books was they wished that I'd never thought of it. Because it was plausible. Ooh. They could see do it. And, you know, it's one of the, it's, quite frankly, a zombie apocalypse is something that's, that's virtually inevitable. Because someday some idiot is going to build one just to say they did. Um, and, and they were looking at it and going, yeah, um, that's basically technology we've got now or will have in the very near future. So the assistant director of CDC, at the very least, really does not like my books. <laughs> so they are scientifically accurate. That's that's what I'm, I've worried about is is writing a book. Like I had a terrorist story that I was thinking of doing, but I'd be afraid that I'd give somebody ideas. They already you have worry ideas. About that? Well, some, of, some of the stuff in Ghost is close enough to what ISIS was doing that. Um, you know, people are like, did ISIS read Ghost and come up with these ideas? And I and I said, no, I wrote Ghost because I understand Islamics. Wow. Um, because, you know, that was just something that, that that's that's how they think. Um, the, the really hardcore fundamentalist. I've got friends who are Islamic. I'm not talking about everybody who who believes in Islam. Um, but the, the hardcore fundamentalist Islamics are, uh, you know, they, they've got a certain mindset. So. I've actually got fatwas. I've got death fatwas against me. Oof. Um, my books. Like the number two guy in Al-Qaeda has got a death fatwa out against me. Um, one of my characters has got a death fatwa. Um, so an imaginary character in a book was condemned to death by an Islamic player. See, that's the great thing about being a co-author with John. No one shoots the co-author. They always go for the present, not the VP. I'm good. <laughs> There's a reason I stay in this book. <laughs> His writing is just so realistic. Wow. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, in the pre-show, I'm going for it, Winder. Uh, in the pre-show, you described this book as the My Little Pony of Zombieland. So uh, clearly you were joking, right? No? Chirp, chirp. I mean, wasn't that what you were saying, sir? <laughs> me? Oh, did did I describe it that way? Okay, you want me to actually? Okay, cut everything that I just said. <laughs> I can answer that correct. I can a- I can actually do. I, that. I thought you read I it in advance. So I was. Sure. I'm going to ask that one more time, and then you can go. Get, all right. Okay. All right. So in the pre-show, you compared this book to the My Little Pony of Zombieland. Uh, clearly, you were joking, right? you got to be fucking kidding me. Okay. <laughs> I'm so not cutting that. I guess that, part of, I guess that part of it might have to do with finding new friends when all your other friends are dead and using those friendships to rebuild civilization. <laughs> so, Check out. Check I guess friendship is magic. Friend could magic. be. No, I'm going with that's a stupid idea. <laughs> when my little when my okay. little ponies it, does that answer that, that it answer work? That when answer my, little, yes, yes. When my okay. little ponies are involved, we can always blame Wandry. Yep. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, the next question. And we'll put Wandry as a show note just because. All right. Stop it, Seska. Stop it. All right, so we originally were going to ask you about comparisons to 28 Days Later, but you already answered that one, so we are going to skip it. And uh, I noticed that this story had a little bit of a, from the reviews of some of your books, a little bit of a, a vibe similar to the TV show The Last Ship. So, uh, <laughs> and that was the authorial cry of anguish for those that weren't clear. <laughs> In reverse, Under a Grey Sky came out before Last Ship. <laughs> Um, I think it's more of convergent ideation. We just came up with similar ideas around the same time. Or the sons of bitches flat ripped me off. Could go either way. <laughs> Could be that. But his lawyers want you to know he is accusing nobody. This is wild speculation meant for comedic value. The, the, <laughs> the problem with that is that when you go in and you want to pitch this as a TV show, they look at it and they go, oh, so it's like the last ship. And no, it's not like the last ship. It's not like the last ship at all. Um, 
you know, other than it being a plague outbreak and people are at sea, it's not like last year. <laughs> um, but that's the problem with being able to do a pitch for something else. Everybody says, Oh, it's just like the last ship. We've already done that. Um, so that's, that's actually my issue with it. That's why. I okay. Scream. Fair enough. All right. So, All right. So since you said, Go since you said these weren't zombies, like the walking dead, we'll skip that comparison too. We won't insult you further. Uh, and we will move on. Well, we, I've got an answer to that. Oh, okay. We'll go for it. Um, they are not, they're not uh, mystic zombies. Uh, the the term for Walking Dead, where just the dead come back to life, the generic term in the field is mystic zombies. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and I had never watched The Walking Dead. I knew that it was out there, and etc. So after I'd written the first four books, Under a Graveyard Sky, um, Sail of Darkling Sea, Islands of Rage and Hope, and Strands of Sorrow, um, I sat down to watch The Walking Dead because you know. Let's see what it's like. Um, I found it just as repellent as all the other zombie movie and TV show I'd seen. In terms of, is this similar to The Walking Dead? Uh, in the exact opposite. Um, when I lost it with The Walking Dead, when I when I screamed and threw the remote at the, at the TV and refused to ever watch it again, it was when they found the prison in season two. And the reason for that is the main character is a sheriff's deputy from Georgia. Every county county in Georgia knows the location of every prison because in the Rick year, they do transport. Yep. They, they put prisoners to the prisons around the state, whatever county they come from. That way, if there's an escape and they're called in to, do, to help search for the prisoner, they know where the prison is located. So he, what, what was his name? Rick? Yeah. Would have yeah. The location of every prison in Georgia. That sort of complete lack of any research or knowledge of what they're writing about is what generally pisses me off about movies and TV shows anyway, especially ones about an apocalypse or anything gun-oriented. So only uh, my books that, are the antithesis of incompetent misery porn anything to do with Walking Dead. That's a really good point. Now, not only do the, does those kind of stories rely on characters – uh, making uninformed bad decisions over and over again, they kind of rely on an audience that is uh, ignorant or untutored in some of the fundamentals of how an emergency works, how our infrastructure works, how our country is put together. Um, and that's that's irritating. That's profoundly irritating, and is a remote throw at the TV experience for me too. Hmm. It's almost insulting to the people that are watching it. What do you think? I'm stupid. I would think that most of the people who would listen to your podcast, they, they might be into Walking Dead just from the point of view of they like misery porn, but they'd be the kind of people that are throwing the remote at the TV screen, too, because of all of the stupid things that happen, not only in Walking Dead, but in, in, in just, um, what was it? Uh, oh, God. Uh, not Babylon 5, uh, Battlestar Galactica. Okay. Yeah, the new, yeah, she. The new Battlestar Galactica. I don't care about the hot side line, all right? I, I really could not care less. That thing had so many stupid, 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 nobody would make those decisions moments. That it just drove me absolutely insane. And I was talking to some of them about a guy who was a TV writer, and it turned out that he was the guy that wrote most of them. That was at Dragon Con. We were on a panel together, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I was involved with, you know, I, I do I do TV scripts. And I started talking about Battlestar Galactica and, and, and the complete idiocy of a bunch of the stuff. And it turns out that it was all stuff that he'd written. Oops. Really? Out. <laughs> Is that an awkward moment for you? <laughs> little, little <Just> awkward. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked a bunch about Tom and Steve throughout the book. And, uh, but how were there any secondary characters who were especially memorable to you? And do you want to talk a little bit about them? Um, we're talking about in Valley of Shadows and River of Night, right? Just in, in the series, in the universe, because we sort of organize this as universe specific since you've got so many and Mike did write all of them. Okay, well, um, in, the, uh, in the main books, the two that everybody con talks about are Sophie, Faith and Sophia, um, who, are, who were not intended to be the main characters, but ended up pretty much being the main characters in the first four books. Um, and the one that everybody always talks about is Faith, who's the 13-year-old who's totally excited 
because she finally gets a zombie apocalypse. Um, because she's been looking forward to having a zombie apocalypse. Now she's got one, and she's just having a blast um, up to a certain point when it starts to get really, really real. And so you've got this thirteen-year-old girl who's a who's a tactical shooter, um, and really in shape, and and all of that. And suddenly she's dealing with the reality of a zombie apocalypse, and she still maintains her her joie de vie most of the time, but not always. Um, but when that when, when that character lands in New York for the first time, it, it's one of the best scenes in the in the series because she lands and she looks around. She gets the bus. She goes, "Look, shoot! This is a zombie apocalypse. Where's the screaming hordes of undead? Where's the gunfire in the distance? Where's the plumes of smoke? There's nothing happening." Wait, wait! And I think Durant, my gun says, away. And Durant, and Durante says, Queens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Faith is the character that everybody talks about in the first four books. In, in terms of secondary characters in, the, in Valley of Shadows and River of Night, um, uh, Mike killed my favorite secondary character. <laughs> uh, I didn't do that because we needed to. Um, but uh, probably Risky is the main secondary character who is, uh, you know, there, there was a question in here about tropes. Um, Risky's the hot and dangerous Russian chick. Um, and, uh, and she's very well written. Uh, Mike handled the writing of Risky and I think he did it extremely well. Great. Well, thank you. What about you, Mike? <laughs> well, I have my favorites, uh, in the first four books. Um, I rather enjoyed a very mild, almost a tertiary character. Uh, in one of the books, uh, there's an event where people who've been out of the loop for a really long time are suddenly uh, thrust into the maelstrom of, of the fall, capital F, the fall, and be, you know, have to make a decision if they're going to contribute to humanity climbing their way out of the pit or if they're going to be sick, lame, and lazy. And uh, one of the characters has a, a terrific... Um, a terrific moment there within the Valley of Se uh, Shadow series. I particularly enjoyed uh, a character that I wrote that was one of the bad guys. Um, I don't like bad guys that are simplistic or stupid or simply brutish for its own sake. So in Valley of Shadows, there's this informal cabal that forms to uh, basically cooperate in the manufacture of vaccine. The idea being we got to hold on as long as we can, maybe even beat this thing back but we're being held up because of uh, the regulations and how vaccines are developed and tested and distributed. So there's this unholy uh, sort of four part alliance that is built with the cops and city uh, leadership on the one side as a pair and with the banks in a third. And then with what I'll call a very irregular entrepreneurs or the mob is the fourth part. And uh, they're basically gaming the system to try and keep it all running for as long as possible while trying to figure out, you know, each one is min-maxing their own, their own calculations on, you know, when do I stab everybody else in the back so I get the most for myself? And it's, you know, the longer the zombie apocalypse goes before the fall, the, the, the more tense things become. And uh, there's a, a bad guy character uh, that I wrote um, uh, who is – is terrifying. Yeah. Oh, no, they're, they're yeah. Frank Matricardi, <laughs> who is, he's the gangster uh, with the heart of gold. Think, um, uh, think one of the main characters from Goodfellas, uh, but a little bit <laughs> smarter. And uh, he's, he's the, he's the gangster that has a limit. There, you know, there's some things he won't do. And he discovers to his chagrin that not everybody uh, who's a bad guy has limits like he does. Okay. So, uh, um, one of the things that, that Mike was tap dancing around there, uh, is there is a vaccine for the virus. Um, besides the fact that there's, you know, months and months of regulatory hoops that you've got to jump through. The problem is that it's based around the original rabies vaccine, which uses the spine of, uh, something which is infected by rabies is rabies or H73 in the case of this book. Um, and the problem is, is that this H73 only infects higher order primates. Yep. 
And after a while, you run out of chimpanzees and rhesus monkeys to make the vaccine from. And there's only one higher order primate left, Homo sapiens. So to make the vaccine, which the good guys in the book are actively involved in making vaccine, understand this, um, you have to chop up people. Um, and so that is a moral dilemma that occurs very early in wow. Underground Sky. And these people kind of look at it and go, these people are insane. There's no way for us to cure them. And we can save lives by ripping their spinal cords out and turning them into vaccine. Um, and and that's, that's one of the things that all of those characters have to face. And some people don't have any issue with this. Certain people in the mob don't have any issue with it. Um, there's various sociopaths, which are which are very clearly described in Valley of Shadows, that don't have any issue with it. Um, but most people do, uh, even the ones who are actively involved. Um, Sophia, who is one of the teenage girls, she's 15, ends up being laboratory assistant in Under a Graveyard Sky, making vaccine from human spines. Um, and in one of the later books that comes up and, uh, she, uh, it, it's actually what Mike was referring to. Um, she's asked, you know, how can you do that? And she goes, you know, back when I was doing it in New York, it was the worst thing ever. At this point, after having been on the ground fighting in this environment for the better part of a year, it's not even in the top 50 worst things that I've dealt with. And she's 15 years old. I mean, everybody in this book, these books are PTSD as hell. Yeah. Okay. Well, normally, <laughs> normally yeah. we would, you know, I'd skim the reviews because they help the right readers find the right book. So dear listener, please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. But since we talked about the uh, series writ large and there aren't reviews on that, they're individually tagged to books. We're going to move on. Um, was there anything about the Black Tide Rising universe that you uh, wanted to tell us that we didn't ask? Mike? Uh, there's, we talked about, uh, how this isn't strictly misery porn. And I wanted to, I wanted to return to that because the, the thing as strange as it might be to hear the author claim that this is an uplifting story or series of stories, it really is. Um, as bad as things get, people find a way to persist and succeed. And sometimes it's through doing very, very hard, terrible things. Sometimes it's through the blackest of black humor. I mean, we have we have a character who uh, does a, a puppet show using a real human skull as as a puppet uh, to answer you know her own tough questions, and and everybody giggles because it's kind of funny, but it's very grisly. And um, the last bit is around <laughs> the mercy and humanity that takes the, that the characters um, with which the characters act and that they demonstrate on. You know, they bring themselves at risk for strangers with whom they have no personal investment and doing so repeatedly because that's how you dig your way out of the hole, because we are a civilization and we are going to persist. So I find it to be, you know, there's there are tremendous action sequences which are riveting. There are there are gripping and very emotional losses when characters uh, are sacrificed. But in the end, it's about the persistence of our civilization uh, and that's that's so important to me that it really resonates in any of the books that I read that, in this series. And I try to be true to that co-writing with John. All right. So this is the rapid fire question round so we can wrap it up. Any uh, other forms of media coming out, RPGs, movies, video games, et cetera? Um, I'm not sure if I can uh, talk about um, uh, there's we have been trying to get something going with TV show and that kind of hit and bounced, but there's something which is currently under negotiation that would move it into other areas, but I'm not sure if I can talk okay. about it. So uh, right. right now there's nothing. Okay. Solid. Yeah. It's, it's, it's premature, but if it happens, we we'd love to come back on and tell awesome. you all about it. Outstanding. That's a, that's a date. Well, he's a sailor. So maybe I shouldn't use that exact phraseology <laughs> too late. <laughs> Oops. All right. So uh, since I know, Mike, you've got uh, some some uh, exciting plans after the show is over and we're tight on time. Um, can you tell listeners how you can find us as we bring this puppy to a close? 
Uh, well, of course, SF Shenanigans is a well-known watering hole for all fans and lovers of the genre. <laughs> so certainly no more, no more introductions needed there. But uh, I encourage everybody uh, who's listening to, if you have a favorite local con or major regional con, uh, ask the con directors of programming to get John Ringo um, to the con because listening to him in person is is five times as much fun as doing it via podcast. And he's really good about signing all your stuff. So you're not so bad. Talk yourself, your local, Mike. Uh, I, only, I only sign books if I'm okay. breathing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so John, um, how many? You have a number of links, but which one's probably your, the best to reach you? Probably on if our fans to follow what you're doing. Um, I have a lot of links, and I I don't really keep up most. Of them. Um, I uh, I off of uh i'm not officially severed from social media but i essentially severed from social media last september because it just got so stupid um uh but uh my facebook page other people are on fairly frequently if you have any questions you go on uh, my facebook page and ask the question and people will answer it oh, yeah. um ask uh when the next march up country book is coming out or why i never finished series <laughs> my readers will jump on you and tell you to beat your face i, I have uh, yes, that. it is actually so, quite humorous to watch in that dark military humor um so on facebook on yeah, facebook specifically uh, go look up the john ringo fan club and if you're looking for me i'm in that group but you can also find me under uh under my regular name uh mike massa and if there's multiple bike masses, look for the one that has a beer in his uh, in his profile, getting ready to drink it. That's me. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, and then of course for finding sci-fi shenanigans, we have the Facebook group, um, sci-fi listening to sci-fi shenanigans, and I don't remember our Twitter handle. I'm sorry. So we are, our website is www.sfshenanigans.com. Our Twitter is at SFS underscore show. Our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. And our shenanigans Facebook group is facebook.com backslash groups backslash sfshenanigans. Whew, we're done. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder and Seska Smalls, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that uh, archived episode that was in the uh, in the digital memory hole that we found. We thought you'd enjoy it. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the archive for the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back at our regular scheduled time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.